Okay, everyone, we'll go ahead and get kicked off for today's event. Again, I do appreciate every one of you taking time out of your day to join us. Uh, again, my name is Aaron Sumrall. I'm Director of Outreach, Education, and Research for uh, Pig Brig Trap Systems. And uh, today what we're going to do is uh, we're going to be discussing some diseases with uh, with Mike Bodenchuk. Uh, Mike is the State Director for Texas Cooperative Wildlife Services. Uh, I've had the opportunity of knowing Mike for quite a few years now and uh, and always have some some very good discussions about what we're seeing with pigs and so forth. But as, as that state role, uh, that state director position, Mike is an integral component of of working with uh, agriculture, with land and, and and wildlife managers on their pig management, their their predator management, so forth and so on. And uh, Mike has a a, a, a deep uh, satisfaction in working in pig management and predator ecology and so forth and so on. So uh, he's here in my home state as well, out in in that hill country Hondo area. So with that, Mike, I'm gonna go ahead and turn that over to you. We do appreciate you joining us today. You bet. I appreciate the opportunity to, to visit with everybody. The issue of diseases in feral hogs was probably underappreciated. You know, we could go out to a cornfield and see that the corn is knocked down, or we could go to a wetland and see that the, the earth is churned up. But, but what diseases are occurring in pig populations is kind of hard to get your hands, uh, your mind wrapped around, your hands wrapped around, because they are silent. They, they don't manifest themselves out there on the landscape until people come in contact with them, livestock come in contact with them, until they start affecting prey. And so, so we're going to talk about some of those diseases. So I'm going to introduce the wild pig, and we use the term in the U.S. wild pigs to represent feral hogs. They are a non-native species in the U.S. I recognize that we may have many participants perhaps from other countries, and so what we have in the U.S. is, is a, a hybrid between European wild boar and domestic swine. The domestic swine part of it has been present in North America since the 1500s. The DeSoto expedition actually brought the pigs to Florida in uh, 1542. Uh, excuse me, um, 1539, and DeSoto made his way up through Florida over it to the Mississippi River. Um, he actually died along the Mississippi River in, in 1542, and, and, and Wikipedia will tell you that at the time he died, he had four horses and 700 pigs. So pigs were a source of wealth. Pigs were a source of, of food in those days, and and that's where the, the pigs were first introduced into North America. Um, feral swine are a worldwide problem, really, um, except for Europe where they're native, except for Africa where there's some native species, Asia. The feral swine were actually seeded on island environments uh, where there was fresh water so that shipwrecked sailors could actually have a source of protein if they, if they made it to an island. And so this is one of the world's top 100 invasive species. I'm going to talk about diseases as well. And diseases are caused by, uh, by different pathogens. In, in this presentation, I'm using the term endemic diseases, but I fully recognize what's endemic in the U.S. may be a foreign animal disease somewhere else. And in some cases, it may be endemic, like African swine fever. It's a foreign animal disease to us, but it is now endemic in, in parts of, of Europe, um, Asia, and of course, it was always endemic in sub-Saharan Africa. So, so I'm going to be throwing out terms like endemic diseases. I'm going to talk about production diseases. Those are diseases of feral swine or, or wild pigs that get into livestock and cause pathogenic responses in livestock. And then finally, I'm also going to be throwing out the term zoonotic diseases. Obviously, we're concerned about human health in this as well. And zoonotic diseases are those diseases in, in wild pigs that can cross over into humans. So you're going to see that all of these slides are going to have some form of these, these terms in there. And, and again, when I talk about endemic, I'm talking about North America, but they may be endemic elsewhere. Finally, I, I want to introduce the idea of pathogens. There are a number of different pathogens 
that uh, cause disease in feral pigs, cause disease in people. They may not cause disease in livestock, but they would cause a disease in people. Uh, and they roughly fall into categories like viruses, bacteria, parasites, and in the case of chronic wasting disease, we're gonna talk about misfolded proteins. So I wanna make sure you understand that I'm gonna be putting those terms on some of the slides as well. And, and that affects you know, how you combat this disease um, in humans and in livestock. Before I jump into the diseases, there's one disease that's missing from this, this presentation, and that's tuberculosis. Again, I had kind of a, a US-centric view of, of diseases when I was putting this together. Tuberculosis is not endemic in feral swine in mainland US. Tuberculosis is caused by a bacterium, micro, uh, bacterium, um, tuberculum, and, and it's, it is endemic in pigs in certain parts of the world. In New Zealand, where they have TB in brush-tailed possum, they took and radio collared some pigs, turned them loose in the, in the TB area, and a year later, all of the radio collared pigs had TB. So they picked it up from the environment. They're actually a very good sentinel for TB, but worse, they're a very good reservoir. In Molokai, where they've had TB uh, in cattle, they depopulated all the cattle on the island, waited a year, and when they came back with cattle, the cattle got TB again. TB is in the pig population there, and, and it serves as a reservoir. So that's the first disease I want to talk about, but I'm talking about it in, in an absence of a slide because we don't have it in mainland North America. When I talk about surveillance, we're using tissue from the pig or, or blood from the pig in order to look for a disease. We, we, we're pulling samples and sending them to the lab. We collect that tissue from the field when we remove pigs. A true prevalence of disease would be the percentage of positives in a population. And that percentage of positives requires you to do random sampling over a random landscape area and try and develop those things. And, and we don't always do random sampling in Texas. We remove between 40 and 50,000 pigs a year, and we're only sampling uh, between 500 and 1,000 pigs each year. So it's not random. We're going to areas and specifically looking in places where we haven't looked before to see if those diseases are there. So the percentages that I'm going to be presenting in some of these uh, slides are what I would call infection rates. That's the percentage of positives in the sample body, recognize that there's a difference between true prevalence and that. There's another aspect to this that you have to keep in mind. When we talk about seropositives or we talk about antibody positives, these are um, antibodies in the blood system, usually collected from serum, although you can collect it from whole blood. And these are, are um, in some cases, they remain with the pig all their life, but for the most part, they're the result of the infection. So if a pig is exposed to a bacteria or a virus on day one, inside that pig, just like you or I who get the flu, inside the pig, the bacteria or virus replicates itself, starts to attack tissues, you get it to feeling crummy, you, you, you start to run a fever, and for several days, after about day two, day three, you start to shed that bacteria or you start to shed the, the virus or the pig starts to shed the virus. So day one exposure, day three, they start to shed. In, in many cases, day nine, day 10, day 11, the number of antibodies in the blood system have built up, start to attack that and the infectious period is over. And those antibodies remain in the blood. Sometimes the presence of antibodies can be diminished by time. In, in cases of plagues, for example, that, that antibody levels drop to where a year later, you would not be able to detect them with a, uh, with a serum sample. So when I, again, when we talk about prevalence or presence in the samples, some of these 
uh, animals may have been infected. They developed antibodies, but we sample them far enough down the road that the level of antibodies do not test positive in the test. I do want to talk about one other disease, and we'll get to, to pseudorabies or PRV, but we use that as a surrogate. Uh, years ago, I participated in a project with Ukraine where we were concerned about African swine fever coming in from Russia. They eat a lot of pork in Ukraine. They, they were concerned about it affecting their meat system. And the wildlife surveillance in Ukraine was based on hunter harvest. We didn't know how well the antibodies would stand up post-mortem. If you collect a sample at the time of death, that's the ideal sample to get. But what if you don't collect that sample for two hours after the time of death, which is typical for hunter harvested animals? So we did a test on some pigs that we removed by the agency to, uh, removal, and we tested their blood at the time of death, 30 minutes after death, an hour after death, and two hours after death. And all the pigs that were positive at time of death were also positive two hours after death. So if you're thinking about doing some surveillance, you need to understand how to collect those samples and how to interpret those results. But that was positive for, for Ukraine because they could use hunter harvested animals in order to determine whether or not the disease was there. The first disease I have a slide for, the second disease we're gonna talk about is anthrax. And this is uh, an endemic disease in certain parts of the country. Anthrax is a bacteria. It uh, causes uh, disease in ruminants typically, um, although it can also affect horses. It can affect people in certain strains. And in the Western half of the US in dry climates elsewhere, anthrax bacteria becomes a spore in the soil. When the environment dries out, the bacteria will build a protein shield around itself. It stays in the soil and, and is not infectious in that state. When you get the right environmental conditions, which are typically a wet environment followed by high heat, that protein breaks down, the bacteria becomes infectious, and animals that are exposed to it can come up and, and get the, the bacteria pretty quick. Um, pigs, we found out, uh, uh, will contact the bacteria. In fact, they may exacerbate the bacteria in the soil through their rooting uh, behavior. They're, they're turning the, the soil over, spreading those spores, getting them up to the surface. And if you've seen pig rooting, also, the plants that come back in that rooting are typically forbs, so they're fresh, new plants in a wet environment. Deer will stick their muzzle down there. Cattle will stick their muzzle down there, come in contact with that bacteria. So 100% uh, of the pigs that we have tested during an anthrax outbreak had been exposed to the bacteria, had developed antibodies to that bacteria, and none of those had died. During that outbreak, deer were dying all the time. Cattle that were not uh, vaccinated were dying. Horses were getting sick and dying. Sheep and goats were dying in that deal, but pigs were not dying. As a result of that observation, we went out and pulled some blood samples out of our archives. When we collect blood samples, we also archive a serum and we pulled some samples out of the archive, blind samples from areas that had anthrax outbreaks and from areas that didn't have anthrax outbreaks. We didn't tell the laboratory which were which, and they nailed them 100% of the time. They said these pigs have been exposed to, out, to anthrax and they were from areas where anthrax had occurred. So pigs now can become a surveillance tool for anthrax bacteria. We did one more test. We took some pigs from Texas and put them in a biosecure facility and we gave them anthrax. And if you want to get the uh, Department of Homeland Security's attention, tell them that you want to give anthrax to a bunch of pigs. Um, but after we finally got all of the governmental approvals to do this experiment, we found that the pigs not only seroconverted, that is they developed antibodies to the anthrax, but we were able to collect bacteria from the pigs in nasal swabs. 
that means that the pigs are amplifying that bacteria. It's going through their system, it's building up in their system, and they're shedding that bacteria. And pigs, wild pigs use water sources regularly, right? They drink, they wallow, and they're putting that bacteria in those water sources. So pigs in an endemic back, uh, anthrax area are a real bad idea because you're going to amplify that and they're going to spread it from one water source to another. We talk about brucella and brucella is the genus name for a number of species of bacteria. They are endemic in certain populations. We have brucella suis in feral pigs. That's a genus and species name. Um, it does affect livestock, and Brucella abortus is the strain that affects cattle and other bovids. And in the Yellowstone ecosystem in the U.S., we have Brucella abortus in bison and elk, and it can spill back over into cattle. In the, the high-density pig areas in the southeast especially, we do have Brucella in the U.S., say, east of the 100th meridian. But Brucella suis is a different genus and species. In pigs, it's spread as a venereal disease. One boar will breed a sow, another boar comes along and breeds the sow. It can cause abortions in that sow. It can be spread in the milk. When it spills over from pigs into cattle, it causes, uh, it can be detected in milk samples from dairy cattle if they're exposed to it. So that's that's a real problem for milk producers, right? Their pasteurization will clean it up, but they don't want that bacteria in there. The problem is that people can get it. Brucella is a zoonotic disease, and people can get it through contact with blood or other fluids. In the U.S., we have a, a feral swine abattoir industry in Texas and in parts of Louisiana. And those abattoir workers that are opening up pigs, getting blood in their cuts, getting blood on their skin, can be become exposed to that bacteria and it'll come down. And there's all kinds of symptoms to it. It's it skin level infections, those, those kind of things. In veterinarians, uh, it, it, it can be a chronic exposure and cause flu-like symptoms that recur. Undulant fever is the name for the human cases of this. When we talk about doing surveillance for brucella, there's uh, the the surveillance tool is a is is a blood sample, but it was really built for brucella abortus. It's not built for brucella suis, and so we can have false negatives in pig samples because of this test. In an abattoir study, we had 9.38 percent of the pigs um, test positive by blood samples, but we had 13% of the pigs test positive by culture. That is, they pulled lymph nodes and they actually cultured the bacteria and found it in there. That means, by the way, they weren't the same pigs. They, they weren't, there were zero positive pigs or blood test positive pigs for antibodies that were culture negative. There were culture positive pigs that were antibody negative in their blood test. And so we could have somewhere in the neighborhood of 22, 23% when you look at pigs that are either exposed and got over it or currently infected at the time. In a couple of Eastern states, I think Georgia and South Carolina, it can get up to uh, 25, 30% of the pigs are infected at the time. So, so this can be a very chronic infection. It stays in the population, but it's not, always widespread. In one test in four counties here in Texas, we had a single female out of 400 pigs that we tested. One female was positive. We went to the next county to the south of that four county area, and we had 10 pigs in a trap and seven of the 10 were positive. So when you get a positive case, a lot of times it's in boars that are breeding multiple sows, multiple boars breeding the same sow, and you end up with a really hot burning case of that in, in an area. And so the, the, the percent positive really 
doesn't re reflect what's going on all over the, the landscape. Another problem with brucella is that cattle can get it. Remember in pigs, it's a venereal disease, but in cattle, we're not having these boars breed the, the cows, right? They're sticking their muzzle into a, 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 a wallow and drinking water out of it or into a stock pond where pigs have urinated and spread the bacteria. And when the cow tests positive for brucella, it's assumed that it's brucella abortus until they can culture the bacteria. And if, if they can't culture the bacteria, that cow is going to be uh, uh, culled from the population. So we do have B. suis in cattle. And in one case, we had B. abortus spill over into pigs. So the line between these two species may not be as, as well defined as we would like to think. Leptospirosis is a bacterial disease. It is endemic uh, in, in the U.S. It's frequently a waterborne disease. Uh, it is zoonotic. It can get into people. It affects livestock as well. Livestock will come down in production. Um, typically, lepto affects the kidneys. So the, the bacteria goes to the kidneys, survives in the renal tubes there, and in very uh, advanced cases, it can affect respiration. It can, in humans, cause meningitis and lead to death in humans. It, it typically does not. Uh, only a, few, a, a low percentage of cases will go that far. Um, pigs amplify lepto, right? You've got these pigs out on the landscape. We had a, a project where we put uh, radio collars on pigs, GPS collars on pigs, and followed those pigs, and we ended up with something like 14,000 GPS locations. And post hoc, after the, the locations were identified, I asked the researchers to tell me what percentage of those were within 25 meters of water, and 24% of the GPS locations were within 25 meters of water. Pigs hang out for recurring zones. That's not a, that's not a, a, a a giant jump in science, right? But because of that, when they urinate, when, when they defecate, they're putting these pathogens back into the water. And because they're amplified in their body, they're amplified in the environment. Uh, they can also move it from one water source to another water source. Um, le antibody levels are high. Half the pigs will have antibodies to, le uh, to um, lepto. But actually culturing that bacteria out of the kidneys is low. What it means is that they've been exposed, they got over it, but at any given time, three plus percent of the pigs will actually have the bacteria in their kidneys. Um, we use the term pseudorabies when we're talking about feral pig diseases, wild pig diseases. The veterinarians use the term Ajewski's disease, and I apologize to Dr. Ozewski if I mispronounce that. It is a virus rather than a bacteria. And one of the, the, the distinctions is that bacteria, bacterial diseases respond to antibacterial drugs, right? Viruses, there are some antivirals, but viruses tend to be a little more resistant to, to drugs. And this particular virus is a herpes virus. It's in that family of herpes virus. So the, the pathogenicity that I described earlier, on day one, they're exposed. On day three, they built up to where they're starting to shed the virus. On day 10 to day 12, they actually build up enough antibodies. They're no longer shedding the virus, but they hold those antibodies. But this virus remains alive in the pig. It's just not, not uh, manifesting itself. So the pig's no longer shedding the virus, but it still has it. If you stress that pig, the pig will go back and start shedding virus again. So something like a tough farrowing event for a wild pig can cause pseudorabies to become virulent again. Um, trapping and hauling live pigs can cause this disease to become virulent again. It is a non-zoonotic disease. People don't get this, but Pseudorabies is fatal to dogs, 
And we have dogs in Texas, hunting dogs that come in contact with pigs that are actively shedding the virus, and it will kill those dogs. It happens every year someplace in Texas. Pseudorabies is fatal to cats, and there's at least one case of pseudorabies in pigs causing the death of a Florida panther. There's several Florida panthers that have died, but they couldn't identify what caused it. But there was one case where they, uh, they, they had a dead panther, they went in and were able to isolate this virus. So, so this disease has environmental consequences, even if it's not zoonotic. It does cause abortion um, in pregnant sows. It is fatal to pigments under three months of age. Um, it is, like I said, a lifetime infection. In our detailed studies, we were trying to collect 100 pigs out of an area twice a year. And we found the first trip through there is 47% infection rate or antibody rate, which means the pigs had been exposed, they built up the antibodies, they were still, in, they still had the virus, but at the time we killed them, they were, they had enough antibodies that they were no longer shedding the, the back of the virus. On the second trip through there, six months later, is down into the 20s, like 24%. The third trip, 16%. The fourth trip, 13%. And I thought, well, we're really getting on top of this disease. The fifth trip, every six months we're going in there, it was back up to 46%. And what that makes me think is that this disease occurs in an epizootic, rather than a chronic infection across time. Yeah, about every two years, every three years, some environmental stressor will cause one pig to get infected or become infective, and it starts sneezing on other pigs and it'll run through that population. The reason it went down is because we were killing pigs to test them. And so I was taking those antibody positive pigs out of the population until that epizootic occurred. And then it was right back up there to more than half the pigs, or right at half the pigs. A little weird disease, when you start talking about fighting the disease, you really want to fight the disease while they're shedding it, but that may only be every two years. One of the ways to reduce the amount of pseudorabies virus on the landscape is to reduce the number of pigs. Moving to parasites, trichinella. You, you've probably heard of trichinosis, right? It is a parasite. It causes, a, a, it's a worm that gets into the muscle tissue, causes a cyst. It is endemic in the U.S. It's been eliminated from the domestic pork industry. It's been eliminated in a lot of livestock, in all the livestock. It is present in black bears in some places, and it is present in pigs. In humans, if you eat undercooked wild pork, wild pig meat, you can ingest this parasite, which goes through your gut and moves to your muscles. And in an uncompromised human, you might have some of these and not ever know it. Um, it does cause abdominal pains. There's heavy infections can cause muscle cramps. Um, if the muscles that these parasites get into include your diaphragm, it could cause respiration issues. Uh, about three and a half percent of the pigs that we've tested in Texas have this disease or have this parasite. Um, but it's kind of all over the place. It's a low rate, but it's not geographically centered. The way to prevent this is to freeze that meat um, five degrees Fahrenheit for 15 days or more, and you can get rid of this. But if you're as old as I am, we were always taught, don't eat rare pork. You have to cook the meat to 106 degrees internal temperature. Um, I got to be honest, knowing about the diseases and all the cooties that these things have, I don't eat feral swine. But if you're gonna eat feral swine, it's gotta be cooked well, 160 degrees internal temperature. Toxoplasmosis is another parasite. It's actually a protozoan. It is endemic in the US. It is zoonotic, meaning it goes to, to people. And it is meat borne. Again, undercooked wild pig. There are cysts in the meat. 
that go into your intestine. They break down in the intestine, and then that protozoan infects your gastrointestinal tract. It moves into your tract. It doesn't go into the muscles. It's going to stay in your gut. Um, new protozoans from those then can move to other tissues. And this one's a little more resistant. You need to freeze this meat for 21 days. Uh, or again, cook it to 160 degrees internal temperature. Um, in pigs in Texas, we see a 9 to 12% detection rate in adult pigs. It is just about everywhere in the state. And because we have so many pigs on the landscape, it's amplifying it in the environment, if not in the population itself. I want to talk about influenza viruses. We talk about the flu, right? There are viruses that cause the flu in people. There are viruses that cause the flu in pigs. There are viruses that cause the flu in birds. Some pig viruses can cross over to humans. Bird viruses typically do not. They don't use, well, they do use genus and species for viruses but typically they characterize viruses by H's and N1's. And so pigs typically have H1 or H3 viruses. Birds typically have H5 or H7 viruses. The problem for us is that pigs, including wild pigs, serve as a mixing vessel for viruses. They are so close to our anatomy that if a pig is infected with an H1 and an H5 at the same time, the recombinant process of viruses can actually produce something that would be infectious to people. And, and pigs often get these viruses. In, in one watershed where we were doing uh, joint surveillance for uh, bird in influenza as well as other wildlife influenzas, where we had 40% H5 or H7 presence in birds, usually low pathogenic avian influenza. We also had 40 plus percent influenza virus antibodies in, in pigs. To me, that's a function of probably the water there, right? The birds are pooping in the water and the pigs are wallowing in the water and the pigs are adding viruses to the water. Um, but the possibility that a pig could pick up an H5 and have an H1 at the same time and recombinate that is movie of the week kind of stuff. Wild pigs can create novel viruses. And while we spend a lot of time looking for highly pathogenic bird flu, we probably need to be looking at pigs as a source of influenza virus as well. Um, antibody presence in our surveillance shows about 14% antibody positives in the pigs that we sample. But again, that can be very specific in some watersheds. In drier environments, not as high. In wet environments, much higher. Um, some pigs that we have tested have antibodies to multiple viruses. And pigs produce H5 and H7 antibodies, even if they're infected with another kind of virus. So. So we can't really tell what it is they're responding to. We can tell what it looks like that they they produced as, a, as an antibody. Cryptosporidium and Giardia, two different diseases. I put them on the same slide because they're almost identical in the way they work, in the symptoms, in the, the issues associated with wild pigs. They are protozoan parasites. Uh, they are endemic. They cross over into people. They become a production disease in livestock, especially uh, giardia in horses. Horses that get giardia come off in weight. They, they're, they're shedding the, um, the protozoan considerably. You can't see it, obviously, it's microscopic, but, but you'll be looking at, at the horse's teeth to see if you need to float their teeth. You're looking at them for, for signs of, of disease when in fact it may be giardia there. These are waterborne pathogens. The pigs amplify the parasites. When they pick them up from the water, they grow inside there. They move them around the landscape. They shed them back into the water. 
rather than look for antibodies to these because they're parasites, we're actually looking for shedding of that in, in their feces, in their urine. And 1.6% of the pigs that we collected were shedding crypto at the time that we collected them. 4.3% of the pigs are shedding giardia. If you've ever had giardia as a human, you know what it does. The parasite gets in your gut lining, it forms a cyst, the cyst breaks open, causes severe abdominal cramps. Uh, you'll come off food too and, and uh, diarrhea. It can cause people to uh, become dehydrated, uh, chronically dehydrated. Both of these are pretty nasty parasites and, and pigs are spreading them around the water. E. coli or Escheria coli is a, a normal gut flora. It is a bacteria, it's endemic in the US. It is zoonotic, it can also be a production disease in livestock. Uh, this one can also affect ruminants. Saying that there's pig, uh, or E. coli in pig poop is kind of like saying there's oxygen in the air, right? There is E. coli in every gut warm uh, blooded animal gut. Some strains of E. coli are pathogenic. There's the O157 strain that's very famous, causes uh, periodic um, human cases from eating fresh vegetables um, that, that haven't been washed, right? So, so that 157 is the one that everybody wants to focus on. The strains that are in pigs, rather than looking for O157, we took pig samples and sent them to the lab and looked for pathogenic strains. Are these E. coli that we're collecting from pigs going to cause a disease in livestock or a disease in humans? Shiga 1 and Shiga 2 bacteria, which are pathogenic, are found in pigs in Texas. Um, they, because they spend a high percentage of their time in the watersheds, in the riparian habitats, they're spreading that in, in, in places there are watersheds that are impacted above the EPA standards for recreational contact under the Clean Water Act. And it's primarily because of pigs that have access to that watershed. Um, there can be E. coli from birds. There can be E. coli from urban runoff. There's a lot of sources out there. The pigs are actually amplifying that in some places moving it around quite a bit and, and causing watershed level impacts. The presence of E. coli and pig poo is about 100%. They all have it. It's hard to detect. You have to keep this bacteria alive and get it to the lab and have them culture it. And so you might take three or four samples from the same pig and only get one of those four uh, as a positive sample, but that means the pig did have it detectability is pretty hard for E. coli. Some of you may remember a, a spinach case in 2006 out in California. Um, there were uh, hundreds of cases, human cases associated with eating fresh spinach. There were three deaths. There were 31 humans that had renal failure, kidney failure as a result of E. coli buildups in, in there. And in that case, there was the same strain of E. coli that caused the disease in humans that was found on the spinach, was also found in feral swine and in cattle. And we don't have a smoking gun to say the pigs put it on the spinach. Pardon me, what we do know is the pigs had the same part, they had access to the water, so they might have put it in the watershed and then the, the water was used to irrigate the, the spinach. They may have gotten it from another source and moved it closer to the field. The FDA has new rules regarding fresh vegetables that require farmers to do uh, um, surveillance in their fields. And if animal tracks are found in the field, you're, they're supposed to plow up 10 feet around that animal track to prevent the uh, the contamination from making it to the marketplace. So this is a, a very high production disease for fresh vegetable producers and is pathogenic to, to humans as well. Another foodborne uh, bacteria is salmonella. 
Uh, it is endemic in the U.S. It's, it's, there's a lot of different species of salmonella bacteria. It is zoonotic. It causes uh, gastrointestinal problems in that. You can get contact with this through cleaning pigs. You also get contact from food that's contaminated out there. In humans, it causes abdominal pain. You might eat a, something infected or eat a sandwich after you've cleaned the pig and, and not washed adequately. And three to seven days later, you're going to have abdominal pains. It doesn't cause immediate symptoms. It will cause diarrhea. The, the part that scared me, I guess, is that so many pigs have this bacteria. In a, a sample of 700 pigs from Texas, 100 in each of seven ecological areas, over 40% of the pigs were shedding salmonella at the time they were killed. So it's not like, oh, they've been exposed once in their life. They are actively shedding this all the time out there in the watershed. Um, another source of potential uh, contamination that people don't talk about a lot with salmonella is, is the same as with like urban ge geese that, that poop on the sidewalk. People may walk through an infected area may get some salmonella on their shoes and then track it into their homes. If you've got babies crawling around on the ground, leave your hunting boots outside because they're very susceptible to this kind of gut infection. And you get that in your carpet and, and babies will pick it up very readily. So, so be careful of that if you're, if you're out in the field and you might've got some on your shoes, and you've got children crawling around the house. Hepatitis E, like salmonella, it is, is pretty ubiquitous out there, but it, it, like salmonella, it doesn't cause fatal diseases except in maybe immunocompromised people. Um, hepatitis E causes swelling of the liver. Um, it is a virus. It is endemic, but not common. It does cause that in people. Um, there are probably thousands of people that have been exposed to hepatitis E and never known it. They didn't have the symptoms, or the symptoms, slight liver swelling, might have just been like, oh, I ate too much today. There is a well-studied case here in Texas where a landowner shot three pigs in a center pivot irrigation area, drug them out of the field without wearing gloves, and he ended up needing a liver transplant to survive. Million dollar infection as a result of, of not wearing PPE. So um, it, again, it's, it's, it, it is not even detectable without certain tests in most people. They, it, it can be asymptomatic but it is out there in pigs. And when it does manifest itself, it causes a real problem. I wanna talk about diseases that we'll categorize as foreign animal diseases. And I apologize to our foreign uh, participants here. It, it, foreign in this case is to the continental US, right? Um, these may be endemic diseases in other countries. Classic swine fever is the new name for what used to be called hog cholera. It is a foreign animal disease in the U.S. It was eliminated here in 1976. So a vast campaign to get rid of this disease actually worked. It is a virus. It's non-zoonotic, but it is devastating to pigs. It causes 80, 90 plus percent uh, fatality in domestic pigs. We're doing classic swine fever surveillance just to make sure the disease doesn't pop up somewhere. But this virus is, is uh, not currently found in the U.S. It is something that we're concerned about. African swine fever, another disease that we're concerned about in the U.S., it is a foreign animal disease. Non-zoonotic, but highly fatal to pigs. The strain that's circulating right now in uh, Europe, in European uh, Russia, and, and in Asia, was 90 plus percent fatal to pigs. It causes the liver, this is the, the, the swell, the, the spleen, this is a picture of the spleen. Um, very, very 
virulent in pigs. They come down with the disease in short order. It's a weird virus in that it is environmentally stable. It can survive outside of the host pig and typically is moved by humans on undercooked pork or cold cured pork. You can find it in sausages. You can find it in jerky. You can find it in the container. Once it's in the environment, it can be moved around on dust and on mud and on things like that. So, so it, it also can be moved on, on what they call fomites. It's endemic to sub-Saharan Africa. Below the Sahara, wild pigs have this disease. They don't succumb to this disease. But when it's moved into Europe, domestic pig, European wild boar are very, very um, uh, affected by this disease. Currently, it's also found in on the island of Hispaniola in the Caribbean. The Dominican Republic and Haiti are two countries that occupy that one big island just to the east of Cuba. And the strain that's circulating there may not be as virulent as it was in Europe and Asia. Um, we're seeing that it might be in the 60% fatal range which actually creates some problems for us, right? The survivors that may be shedding the virus actually pose a bigger risk than the pigs that die from the virus. And so this is a disease that we're very, very concerned about. If you have an African swine fever case in your country, not only are you gonna depopulate a lot of domestic swine if it gets into the domestic swine, but you're going to lose the trade with other countries because of the risk of it. When a single wild boar came up positive in Germany, Germany lost their export markets to Asia, particularly China. And so it, while it, it may cost millions to depopulate the pigs, it costs billions in trade. And for these reasons, we are doing surveillance for African swine fever. We, especially in feral swine. We want to show our trade partners that we're looking and it's not here, rather than just turning a blind eye to it. Um, we're doing surveillance in high risk areas around um, airports and ports where trash from a ship or trash from an airplane might be dumped in a, a landfill and then feral swine have contact with that. We're doing surveillance along the U.S.-Mexico border where there's a lot of people coming across the border. Some of them are camping in the desert. Some of them are leaving trash and that trash may have infected uh, particles on it. And so we want to make sure that the African swine fever is not coming across the border with those people. We're doing blood surveillance for this, both looking for antibodies and using PCR to look for the bacteria, or the the virus, excuse me, in uh, in the pigs themselves, in the case that they don't build the antibodies to it. Foot and mouth disease, another foreign animal disease to us. It is a an endemic disease in parts of South Africa, Southern Africa, and parts of, of uh, South America. It is viral. It's highly contagious disease. It's not zoonotic, but it does affect wildlife as well as livestock. In swine, it causes lesions in the mouth and the nose. This picture of a, a, a tongue shows those lesions in there. And the animal comes off feed because it just hurts to eat. But it also can cause them to slough their hoof. And a very classic behavior in domestic swine would be for them to be feeding on their front knees because their hooves are sore lesions between there and actually the hoof coming off the bone uh, is, a, is a consequence of this. What's a little bit scary is that we took some feral swine to a biosecure facility and gave them foot and mouth disease and they did develop lesions between the hooves but they didn't come off feet. They didn't feed on their knees. They acted like they were absolutely asymptomatic and they would serve, feral hogs would serve as a reservoir for foot and mouth disease if it ever got into this country. 
we handle a lot of pigs when we do regular control methods. And, and, and so we're looking for these lesions. Uh, we're looking between the hooves to make sure that it's not here, to make sure that um, we've, we've got an adequate sample size to prove that it's not here. There's some other diseases that cause lesions in the mouth and the nose. Uh, the sick ear stomatitis causes the, the lesions in the mouth of horses, for example. And because it looks like FMD, uh, a horse premise with the sick ear stomatitis will be quarantined and those animals will not be able to be moved until they're over the disease. That, that disease is spread by midges as well as nose to nose contact. Uh, I think the last disease I want to talk about is chronic wasting disease. This is a cervid disease. It, it doesn't, it's, it's not supposed to be in pigs. It causes um, neurological disorder in the cervidae family, the deer, and, and not all deer, but, but certainly that. It's caused by a prion, which is a misfolded protein, right? A, a, a regular protein is supposed to be a certain shape, and when it gets misfolded, like a like a slinky, slinky that's twisted out of, out of shape, that protein then causes the disease. In cervid, when that protein contacts another protein, it can cause that other protein to misfold as well. These prions, protein diseases, are extremely environmentally resistant. They're not a, a living thing. They're a, they're a string of proteins. And so in soil, for example, uh, in, the, in the Colorado area where it's been around, it's still infectious 16 to 20 years after being deposited in soil. Uh, prion diseases are what call, also cause mad cow disease, a specific prion that causes a disease in cattle. A specific prion causes a disease in sheep. A specific prion causes it in deer. The prions that cause CWD in deer do not cause the disease in pigs. The pigs don't get chronic wasting disease. What happens though, is the pigs are picking up those prions and those prions are being stored in the pig at the very least. We went into an area where uh, chronic wasting disease is just coming into the state and we had not done any pig control ever uh, as an agency. And we collected, uh, I wanna say it was 80 pigs. and took brain samples and lymph nodes, retropharyngeal and submandibular lymph nodes. And those lymph nodes had chronic wasting disease prions in them. They, they took those prions out of the pig lymph nodes and injected them into genetically altered mice that are supposed to respond the way a deer would respond. And it caused the uh, neurological disorder in the, in the mice. So, we know the pigs are picking them up. We know that they're holding them in there. What we don't know yet is do pigs shed those prions in urine and feces and nose-to-nose -nose contact the way deer might? And do prions multiply within the pig? At the very least, the pig can pick it up, and when it dies, it's going to put those prions in the soil in a new place. And, and if you understand how feral pigs move around the landscape, they move in a four to 10 mile range, unless they're in the back of a truck or a trailer, and then they can move all over the place. So in, in pigs coming from prion specific areas could be moving prions to whole other areas. So, so the more you know about it, I, I like this slide. This is a picture of a train wreck, and this is what pigs are, ecologically, environmentally, economically, a train wreck, and and from the disease standpoint, it's something that we don't really talk about much because there's all these other problems associated with pigs, but diseases are also a big problem associated with feral hogs or wild pigs. Yes, sir, Mike. A uh, ton of good information here. We've definitely got some some questions that have come in. 
uh, again, too, folks, while we start covering these first questions that I've gotten uh, written down here, uh, put your questions, if you've got any more, in the in the Q&A or the chat feature there at the bottom, and uh, Brooke and Anna Maria will help me make sure that I don't miss any of these questions. But one of these, Mike, that, that come in very early on in the presentation, I think you've covered it uh, multiple times in there about different diseases individually, but the question was about harvesting and eating pigs uh, that you got off your own ranch. Is it safe to do so, and what would you recommend? And I think you covered a lot of that that food safety aspect as far as proper temperatures of freezing and cooking and so forth. Freeze that meat for at least 21 days to get rid of all the pathogens, cook it to 160 degrees. I, if you listen to this presentation and you still want to eat a pig, I guess you can, but um, I don't. <laughs> I'm sorry. They just, right. the acuity factor is way too high for, for me to eat one of these things. Another question in here, too, is, is uh, I guess these are good things here, too, that wanted to know, is there a place in the states, and this this question particularly came in from Texas, uh, is there a place in the states where people can drop off samples uh, where they can they can have them either part of one of the studies that y'all may be doing or or just personal um, personal knowledge? Uh, I'd recommend it uh, in, the, in a quick response is if it's for personal uh inquiries about the the texas a m vet diagnostic lab if there was anything that they may want to do there or anything like that but is there anything that they can do uh to drop off samples or whatnot um it, it, to to get a more concise yeah so insight? You, you would need you would need to establish whether it's in texas or not you would need to establish a relationship with your veterinary diagnostic lab and not every state's got one and not every state that has one can do every test. Um, Kentucky, for example, has a brucellosis center. And so a lot of our, our samples actually go, our national samples go to the Kentucky brucellosis center because that's what they do. For the E. coli testing, we send it to Pennsylvania where there's an E. coli reference lab. So the best way somebody could do that is through their local veterinarian. Say, look, I want to have this tested. And I, I think this is where we send it and have that veterinarian send it. And then they would get the results back and, and, and it, it becomes a priority there. I will say that we are uber sensitive to mortality events. If somebody finds five dead pigs together that don't have bullet holes in them, that don't look like they were drug out of a trap, we'd like to know about things like that. So contacting wildlife services, that those are symptoms of foreign animal diseases, and we do want to test those. And so um, contacting uh, one of the wildlife services district offices in Texas, one of the state offices in another state or our state office in San Antonio for mortality events would be important. Okay, I got a question that just popped up here uh, real quick. It says, can you repeat the information on the regulations around E. coli with removing uh, produce around the pig, or removing produce around pig tracks? So the FDA has those rules and I'm, I'm quoting from my understanding of it. You do want to look at the FDA site, but typically what they have is if there's tracks in a field, they want the farmer to plow up any crop around that track in a 10 foot radius. So you'll see more and more, especially here in Texas, where pigs are a real thing, but so are deer, that, that farmers that are growing fresh vegetables for market consumption are doing it behind a high fence, game-proof fence, to keep from having to lose their crop if a deer walks across there or a sounder of pigs comes in. Uh, the other one is a uh, um, individual that says that he is in the after dispatching pigs uh burying carcasses is that a proper way to to dispose of those animals or what is the proper way uh should he continue to bury them or, or any other suggestions so there's a couple of council for agricultural science and technology publications on carcass disposal typically those publications deal with large volumes of carcasses. If you had a hurricane that killed thousands of animals or you had a flood or you had something else. But the, the concern that everybody has is creating a bacterial sump. I don't know how many you're trapping at one time, 
But if you put them all in one pile, there could be a bacterial area that develops, especially if you had a trench and you just kept throwing them on top of each other, you know, what, 12 this month, 12 this week and 15 next week and 20 the week after. You're going to have a, not just a, an odor problem, but you're going to have a, a large amount of bacteria that might get to your groundwater. We typically leave our pigs on top of the ground. In Texas, we have enough vultures that it doesn't take very much time for the, the, the carcasses to be, to be uh, consumed. But you want to have them scattered out. Again, you don't want to pile them up. If you ever have some time, you could Google the term uh, a river of maggots. They actually did a large carcass dump disposal and found that there were some ecological consequences associated with piling up carcasses above ground. So putting them underground, covering them up is okay, but don't do it all in the same place. Don't do it time after time after time. Move that spot around. And there, if you're talking about a trap full, 20 pigs or, or less, you may be able to just leave them on top and let the vultures scavenge them pretty quick. We've measured runoff associated with that, and, and there really isn't any bacterial runoff. And then there, here's one that just come in, in I guess, in um, piggybacking off of what you just said there. It says, what about the vultures feeding on the infected carcasses? So, I mean, is, is there anything that they could pick up? Vultures are literally designed to do this, right? It, they're the worst sentinel you could think of for diseases not because they don't eat gross stuff, but because they're, uh, they've adapted to where it doesn't affect them. The concern we have is with these foreign animal pathogens, African swine fever, classic swine fever, foot and mouth disease, they can spread those pathogens to wherever they go to roost. And so we're concerned about it with the foreign animal diseases, but with the endemic diseases, we're not too worried about that. Okay. Now, what about uh, another question come in too with the the disposal? What about burning uh, pig carcasses? Is there any 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 issues with burning a carcass? Texas uh, in Texas, the Texas um, Council on Environmental Quality actually does not permit burning of carcasses as a disposal method. Um, we did a study as kind of a test for. Um, uh, foreign animal disease response, where we covered the carcasses with uh, agricultural lime, right? You, the, the powdered lime. And to cover, completely cover a pig carcass, it takes about 150 pounds of lime, it takes three 50 pound bags. Um, but they did control scavenging by covering that carcass. Um, for several days, that no, no scavengers got into the carcass. So so it gives you a little bit of a window if you're worried about a foreign animal disease, but it also covers that carcass and allows it to rot down. If you've got a lot of pigs on your landscape, you may end up with big, big white patches out in your pasture because you've killed them all over the place. So it may not be appropriate for everything, but agricultural lime will do it. The burning of carcass does pre present some problems, and at least in Texas, TCEQ does not permit that. Yeah, one of the things about, in addition to what you're talking about with burying those carcasses, I know that uh, Georgia requires that you keep those carcasses at least eight foot above groundwater. So you've got to go in to do a little bit more research on where you can bury where you can't uh, to know where yeah. those water tables are too. So uh, that's just make sure you check with your individual uh, authority on that. It may be the Animal Health Commission in your particular state or the Water Authority, like what Mike's referring to, uh, to, to make sure you're you're on the right side of the law. Uh, the other question we've had here, too, it's a little bit of a shift of gears there, Mike, but it's I think it's pertinent. Um, can diseases cause problems in fish ponds, uh, diseases posed by pigs um, in the water systems and so forth? Give give any concern to the, to the fish in those ponds? Not, not, not to the fish in the pond. I mean, um, if if carcasses aren't disposed of properly, you, you know, you leave a pig too close to a water source, you could have runoff you know, right at the edge of the water or something like that. But we're not terribly concerned about the fish in the pond. But as I mentioned with Brucellus, the pond is probably the, the 
common denominator for some of these diseases. The, the pigs may be urinating in a wallow at the edge of a pond and then a cow sticks her muzzle or a deer sticks her muzzle in that, that, that wallow and picks up those pathogens there. So it's, it's not damaging the pond, but the, the water source is that common denominator for transmission. So no worries about eating the catfish out of your farm pond that, that I, I, pigs I maybe use the same Yep, yeah, that's right. I would right. not worry. Mike, we do appreciate it. Um, a lot of a lot of outstanding information, and also too, people that that, that for y'all that were were with us today, pass the word and let your friends and everyone know about it uh, about these webinars and so forth. Uh, these are recorded, so if they weren't able to. Um, a join today we can we can send the recording out the link out so forth and so on we do a webinar every month uh that's a pig pig brig hosted webinar every month that i'll cover a topic or one of the team members will cover a topic uh typically on the fourth thursday of the month uh then what we are going to do uh we started it out with dr grimsey in june uh with having an expert a global expert uh join us for these midday events uh quarterly and um, and and make sure that if you know a topic you would like to hear more about from a, uh, a global expert on pigs to get that information to us. Probably the next one's going to be uh, December, and 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 uh, we want to make sure that we keep information that you're looking for uh, pertinent. So I do know that we did have something else that was. Let's see here. Uh, yeah, a lot of folks coming in here. Thanks, Mike. Great presentation. Excellent information. Uh, the other thing here. It says, uh, and I'm just reading it off immediately, just as I see it, we freeze pork and cook it as well. Is there still a problem with eating the pork? So I think that's something that, that you know, you talked quite a bit about that, making sure that they, they freeze it for the right length of time, that you cook it to the right temperatures, so forth and so on. But um, yeah, I think that's a, that's a, that's got some people definitely pondering that thing about using it as a protein source. Yep. Now the last uh, the last headline I ever want to see in my life is that USDA feeds disease hogs to the homeless. We do not collect the meat. We do not use it. Uh, but but I understand that people don't want to be wasteful. But please be careful. This this can create some problems if you're not careful with how you handle it. Yeah, and I get a lot of questions all over everywhere that that no matter where you go, a lot of folks ask the question, and and it's a usually it's a, a layman's audience that that they see it as a protein possibility there, and and don't want to be wasteful, and they ask quite often, uh, why is why is this meat not being used in in uh, restaurants and in places like that and different sources? Well, the the main reason is just not state inspected. Uh, because of that disease possibilities and whatnot. The other thing is too is I mean the domestic pork industry is is already got the challenges that it that it has with 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 getting fair prices and so forth. And to inject that much wild protein in there would be catastrophic to that domestic to that domestic source. So um, we we actually did a project yeah. where we where we moved pigs to. Um, to a food bank. It, it, we ended up, because we can't control what they do with the meat, we ended up having to have it processed to move to the food bank. And by the time we were done, we could have bought T-bones and given them to the food bank. It's not, a, it's not an economically viable activity to catch a pig, get it inspected, get the meat processed, and then give it to the food bank. We'd have been better off supplying safe, healthy meat rather than, than feral swine, so. Right. All right, anybody else have anything else they want to, to add to or, or any questions? Aaron, it looks like there is one more question from Anonymous. Um, in freezing, how low the degrees is needed? Uh, will normal home freezer work? Um, normal home freezer should take me to five degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, I think that's minus uh, don't get me wrong on centigrade, it's something like minus 18 centigrade, but five degrees Fahrenheit and a home freezer should do that. I don't see anything else on my end, Mike, as far as questions or anything like that. Just uh, we do have a definitely a cross section of folks today that were from both agencies, uh, universities and private. So. Good. Glad it was helpful. I do appreciate your time. All right. We do appreciate it. Thank you all for attending. Mike, we do appreciate it. Thank you again, too. And uh, with that, I guess we'll uh, we'll end the event.